Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. By now you've probably taken your first test. I hope it went well for you. We're almost to the point where we'll be able to talk in more detail about how and why chemical reactions happen, and how we can tell what the products of a reaction will be. But before we get to that, we need to talk about something you've probably heard in lots of advertisements on TV and online. Whenever you see an ad for a sports drink, you've probably heard them talk about electrolytes. For example, here's part of an ad for Gatorade. When I'm running out the tunnel, only one thing's going through my head. I have to go out there and leave my team. I make my body ready for game time by drinking Gatorade Prime. Moment before the tip, I'm usually smiling and I'm ready to have fun. Electrolytes are important for maintaining the balance of minerals in your body during exercise, but it turns out they're also really crucial for understanding all chemical reactions. So what is an electrolyte? Well, it turns out that most chemical reactions we use in lab don't take place between two solids. For example, sodium iodide and lead 2 nitrate are both solids at room temperature, but if we combine the solids, not much happens. Instead, we usually perform this reaction by dissolving them each in water, then combining the two solutions. This is true for a vast majority of reactions we do in lab. The chemical reaction doesn't take place between two pure solids, or liquids. Instead, we dissolve each of them in water, which gives us what's called an aqueous solution. We can show this when we write a chemical reaction down. For example, Here's that reaction where we combine sodium iodide and lead 2 nitrate. First, I want to write what happened when we combined the two solids. We can write the phase of each compound as a little abbreviation in parentheses after the formula. In this case, they were solids, so we write a little s in parentheses. As you might remember, nothing happened when we combined the two solids, so we'll write that on the product side. If we had had a pure liquid instead of a solid, we'd write an L in parentheses, and if it were a gas, we'd write a G. But what about our situation, where we had dissolved a compound in water? That's not a pure liquid because it has something dissolved in it, so we shouldn't use the L. Instead, when we have a compound dissolved in water, we use AQ. That lets us know that we're using an aqueous solution. So in our case, we combined aqueous solutions of sodium iodide and lead 2 nitrate. Our products were sodium nitrate and lead 2 iodide. As we'll see in the next video, the sodium nitrate is another aqueous solution. The sodium nitrate molecules are dissolved in water. And the lead 2 iodide is a solid, so we indicate that with an S in parentheses. That's what the beautiful yellow compound in the solution was. Finally, we have to balance the reaction. You'll notice that there are two iodines on the right, so we need a 2 in front of the sodium iodide molecule. And now there are two sodiums on the left side, one for each sodium iodide, so I need a 2 in front of the sodium nitrate molecule to balance those out. If you check, you'll see that this reaction is now balanced. If you've forgotten how to balance chemical reactions, you should review that skill by watching my earlier video on balancing reactions. It turns out that there's something very basic and very important to know about dissolved compounds. You might recall that several videos ago, I told you about the difference between ionic compounds and molecular compounds. Remember, ionic compounds contain at least one metal and one nonmetal, but molecular compounds are composed only of nonmetals. So take sucrose, for example. Sucrose is table sugar, and its formula is C12. H22O11. Those are all nonmetals, so that means sucrose is a molecular compound. If I were to write a reaction in which solid sucrose dissolves in water, here's what it would look like. On the left, we have sucrose with a little s in parentheses because we're starting with the solid. After it dissolves, we have an aqueous solution, so we put an aq after the sucrose on the product side. That's all pretty simple. But what if we have an ionic compound? For example, suppose we dissolve salt, sodium chloride, in water. It turns out that when you dissolve an ionic compound in water, the molecules break up into the ions they're made of. 
So salt breaks up into sodium ions and chloride ions. If you look at the periodic table, you can see that sodium has a charge of plus one and chloride is minus one. So those are what we get on the product side of our reaction. These dissolve in the water, so that makes them aqueous ions, and we write AQ after each. So why do the salt molecules break apart into ions? The secret has to do with the molecules of water that they're dissolving in. If you look at a water molecule, you'll notice that it's V-shaped, so both of the hydrogen atoms are on the same side of the molecule. If you check the periodic table, you'll notice that hydrogen ions have a positive charge, and oxygen ions have a negative charge. Now in a water molecule, the hydrogens and oxygens aren't ions, but as we'll see later in the course, it's still true that the hydrogen side of the water molecule is more positive, and the oxygen side is more negative. That means the water molecules will be attracted to things that have a charge. If something has a positive charge, the negative side of a water molecule will be attracted to it. And if something has a negative charge, the positive side of a water molecule will be attracted to it. So suppose we drop a salt crystal into water. Let's look at what will happen to it. The NaCl crystal is made of purple sodiums and green chlorides. The sodiums have a positive charge, so the negative side of the water molecules will be attracted to them, and the waters will pull the sodiums away from the crystal. The same happens to the chlorides. The positive side of the water molecules are attracted to them and pull them away. As a result, we end up with the sodium and the chloride molecules all separated from each other and floating around in the water. By the way, this happens in all kinds of ionic compounds, even ones with polyatomic ions. For example, instead of sodium chloride, suppose we dissolved potassium sulfate in water. It's an ionic compound, so it'll dissolve into the ions it's made of. There are two potassium ions, and these will each be pulled away from the crystal by water molecules, so we get two separate K plus ions. The other ion is sulfate, which has a minus two charge. Notice that the atoms in a polyatomic ion stay together. The sulfate doesn't split into separate sulfur and oxygen ions. This is true for all the polyatomic ions you learned about, like nitrate and hydroxide and so on. They stay together when the compound dissolves. So, why are these ions important? It turns out that dissolved ions have a really interesting property. Solutions with ions in them can carry an electrical current. Solutions with no ions in them can't do that. So, for example, suppose I take a sample of pure water and try to pass a current through it. In this case, the voltmeter is actually measuring the resistance. The better the solution is able to conduct electricity, the lower the resistance is. As you can see, when we have just water, the resistance is very high. It's about one mega-ohm, so one million ohms. That's a very high resistance, and it shows that the solution isn't conducting electricity. Next, I'll add sucrose. As you can see, when I add sucrose, the resistance doesn't change very much. That makes sense, since because it's a molecular compound, the sucrose isn't producing ions, and the solution still doesn't conduct electricity. Finally, I'll add salt, and as you can see, the resistance goes down quite a lot. It goes from 1 mega-ohm down to about 0.5 mega-ohms, and then once I stop stirring, it goes down even more, and the scale changes. It stops at about 15 kilo-ohms, so just about 1.5% of what it started with. That's because of the ions that sodium chloride produces as it dissolves. So water containing dissolved ions can carry an electrical current. For that reason, ionic compounds that can dissolve in water are called electrolytes. The name electrolytes gives you a hint as to what's going on. The electro tells you that solutions of electrolytes can carry electricity. Sometimes it surprises people that pure water doesn't conduct electricity very well. They're used to hearing that you should get out of a pool when an electrical storm is coming, and they know that if you drop an electrical appliance into a bathtub, you can get a shock. But that's because pool water 
and tap water both contain ions, so they conduct electricity. Now that we understand electrolytes, we're ready to talk about why and how chemical reactions occur. We'll start that in the next video, which will be the first of a three-part series on different kinds of chemical reactions. Until then, have a great week, and I'll talk to you again soon.